I'm Steve Ballard and this is Inside ECU. We are now in our second century. We employ 6,000 people and train almost 28,000 students. Our goal is to be a national model of public service and regional transformation. We have a responsibility for giving back to the public that supports us by educating tomorrow's leaders, curing diseases, and helping neighborhoods, communities, and our state. This program gives you an in-depth look at our work and the successes that we experience every day. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Inside ECU. Hi, I'm Chris Dansberry and this is Inside ECU. In this episode, we're going to take a look at what has become a national epidemic, and that's obesity. Over the last couple of decades, the number of people who have become overweight or obese have grown exponentially. At East Carolina University, faculty, clinicians, and researchers are looking at ways to tackle obesity from all levels. We're going to look at some of the work being done in the Pediatric Health Weight Clinic, especially dealing with childhood obesity. Also, Dr. Joseph Pomard and the folks over at the Human Performance Lab, they're going to show us about the areas where fat settles and also how exercise can help us get rid of those areas. And then finally, we're going to show you everything that you need to know from food nutrition labels to serving sizes and portion sizes and also what foods have certain amounts of fat and sugar. But there's so much great work being done at East Carolina University that Chancellor Steve Ballard asked Dr. David Collier, a top researcher in obesity at East Carolina, to come and deliver some eye-opening and startling statistics and findings at the 2009 Chancellor's Convocation. Um, the World Health Organization now recognizes the medical complications associated with obesity as a greater threat to worldwide health than health problems related to undernutrition. And in the United States, we find ourselves in the peculiar position of having the first generation of children who are expected to not outlive their, their parents due to obesity-related complications. The rel prevalence of childhood obesity over the past 40 years. From the 60s to 70s, in every age group, we had 3 to 4 percent of children met the criteria for obese. Over the past three decades, that has tripled or quadrupled in every age range. One reason this is a problem can be seen by tracking the numbers of obese children into adulthood. You see that a full 70 or 80 percent of children, adolescents who are obese, become obese young adults. A full 50 percent of three to six year olds are destined to become obese adults. And even a full quarter of one to three year olds who are already obese will ultimately become obese adults. It's uh, of epidemic proportions, probably one of the most serious public health concerns in the pediatric world, um, especially in this country. Let's take it even closer, Eastern North Carolina. Eastern North Carolina is bad. <laughs> Eastern North Carolina, um, rural, uh, relatively poor, um, our concerns about pediatric obesity are even bigger than some other areas of the country. The Pediatric Health Weight Clinic deals with all ages, so they see kids as young as two years old who already have body mass index, or BMIs, well above where they should be. However, the majority of the kids they are following are probably between 10 and 16 or 17 years old. I will tell you that the kids that we see through the clinic, um, for clinical and also who are involved in our research, are well over the 99th percentile for their BMI. So these kids are, if we, we don't really use that term in pediatrics, but they are probably morbidly obese. That's right, morbidly obese. Dr. Gross McMillan gives credit to the school systems for taking a proactive stance on eating better and staying active, but is the message getting to the kids early enough? We used to think that that was, well, let's keep them active in elementary school. Then we realized, well, we have to keep them active during their preschool years. And so and that early intervention piece keeps going back further and further and further. Um, we've got our hands full both on the treating those kids who are already overweight as well as trying to prevent what could be coming. What to do is a simple enough solution, but there is a great deal of commitment that must take place and by more than just the person trying to lose weight. 
changing lifestyles and, and changing lifestyles in terms of um, nutrition and eating habits and what we eat and physical activity um, in the very busy lives of kids and families is huge. And so it, this is a long, long-term fix. One issue for children who fight being overweight and obese as adolescents is they can experience osteoarthritis in their knees in the ages of 20 and 30 instead of their 40s and 50s. Child has to be ready for change. The family has to be ready for change. Our community is not as ready for change, I think, as we should be. One person ready for change is Marcus. He's 16 years old and is working with Dr. Gross McMillan as well as Dr. Blaze Williams in ECU's Pediatric Healthy Weight Clinic on a regular basis. There are a number of uh, clinical measures that um, we're interested in trying to associate with um, how individuals walk um, and how um, anthropometrically those things uh, affect them, so their, their structure, how that affects how, how you actually walk. Um, very simple things like, like knee strength, so um, if you kick your leg out straight and hold tight there, I can look at how strong Marcus is in this knee and I'll relax in this knee as well. Dr. Williams is also interested in Marcus's foot resting in a neutral position as well as the angle of his foot relative to his lower foot because they can have significant implications to what happens when he stands up. This is sometimes called pronating or the foot collapsing in. When he goes the, and when, he, when he does that, I'm interested in what's happening in his feet, what, how much pronation is actually occurring. What's happening in your knees? Are they coming in in this direction? Are they going out in this direction? And what's, what's happening in your, in your hips? So let's do that one more time. Yeah, also look at symmetry, how much weight he's got on each limb. Um, and that can have an impact. If this foot collapses down, you can see that the weight is more on the inside of, of his foot and therefore the weight's actually coming up into his knee and forcing his knee kind of in this way. And thanks to modern technology, the clinicians can apply what they see on their computers to patients almost immediately. They can test different shoes or orthotic devices with individuals to see what forces and stresses are occurring. Visually what I see, and of course the, the data would tell us more, but visually what I see is the direction of that red line being focused more inward towards the pelvis that's a bad sign. We would expect that that would be focused more towards the hip joint rather than towards the pelvis. If we are encouraging people to exercise, um, if they are obese or they do have cardiovascular compromise and we want them to exercise, it's important for us to understand how can they exercise safely. And that's our, that's our main goal. And that safe exercise means exploring options outside the standard walking and running activities. It may be that um, the safe way to go with these kids is, is some semi-weight-bearing types of activities where they're um, in um, aquatic therapy, for instance, where they're in the pool and they're unweighted to some, to some degree. Or maybe they need to start in a recumbent bicycle um, and that, that walking or stairs or, um, eat, or certainly running would need to be limited up to a certain point. The catch-22 is we want to encourage them to exercise, but we also want to um, make sure that they're doing that in a safe way without, without scaring them away from exercise. And while they continue to make strides with young people, doctors Gross McMillan and Williams say there's great value in broadening the attack on obesity across East Carolina's campus. I think that a collaborative approach is extremely important. Um, otherwise, we have a whole lot of different people doing very important work, but they each do their own little individual pieces of important work. And until we kind of bring that all together, um, so together we, we will achieve a whole lot more towards preventing and treating these kids um, compared to if we are each doing our own little thing. It has to be multidisciplinary. So for example, uh, we've uh, collaborated with folks in nutrition here on main campus, in the School of Medicine, the departments of physiology, departments of biochemistry, uh, the clinical departments such as the Department of Medicine to uh, be able to look at subjects, to be able to use their resources to try to figure out you know, what is it that makes people perhaps predisposed to obesity, but then also on the flip side what can we do about obesity? So uh, to do that, you really need a bunch of different viewpoints to be able to even begin to tackle it. 
Dr. Joseph Homard is the director of the Human Performance Lab in the College of Health and Human Performance. He is a firm believer in exercise contributing to a healthy lifestyle, but it's best to get an evaluation first. When you look at, at heart disease, which is linked with obesity, uh, people don't know they have heart disease till they have a heart attack. So getting in, getting things assessed in a good, at a good starting point, knowing where you start is very, very uh, critical. And it also gives you reinforcement as you go through the exercise. Because if you're doing it right, you're going to see improvements. And doing it the right way is important, especially when starting out. For many people, they may exercise for a couple of months and lose only a pound or two. They get discouraged and then quit. So what exactly is the right amount of exercise per day? Well, that's the literally the billion dollar question. I mean, uh, and unfortunately in our media, there's been lots of representations of an hour a day works or 30 to 40 minutes every other day works. Uh, the short answer to your question is nobody really knows. Nobody really knows what the optimal prescription is. But I can tell you with confidence, something is better than nothing. So if you can get out and take two 10 minute walks a day, as opposed to doing nothing, it's going to be better. Just go out there, try to do something, try to get moving. Uh, you know, if you could fit in 40 minutes a day on most days, that would be great. But again, you can't get discouraged by all these stresses that life puts on us. Just try to do something, and it's going to be better than doing nothing. A big part of getting that assessment before starting an exercise regimen is knowing where you're carrying the extra pounds. And that's where equipment like the HPL's DEXA machine come into play. You can find out if you have a lot of fat in your abdominal area which is not a good thing, or if you tend to have more of your fat in the thigh or the rear region, which tends to be a little bit less detrimental. You'll get a picture of how much fat you have there. And thus, if you came to the Human Performance Lab and wanted to exercise for six months, this is a really definitive way of figuring out if you lose the right amount of fat. Machine will actually calculate the volume of fat you have in this area. And this is the area that you don't want to have fat in and that exercise as an intervention almost uh, targets or spot reduces. Dr. Homard says there are some simple things that we can all do in our daily lives that will continue to help our body get healthy. Parking a little farther away, for example, uh, when you walk into work, taking the stairs instead of the elevators, all those are gonna burn calories, but uh, from what we study, most importantly, they're gonna get your muscles to contract. And it looks like if you can just get your muscles to con contract, to do a little more exercise, even if there isn't pronounced weight loss, it's going to make you healthier. And then what that does is essentially tips the first domino. If you can begin to become a little more exercise tolerant, then you can build it into your routine, exercise a little bit more, and with alterations in your diet, then you can start losing weight. Dr. Homard says exercise and diet were meant to work together, and that's when you'll see the best results. There is interaction between them, but uh, getting active is critical. It's critical to, to uh, dealing with the diseases evident with obesity, but it by itself is not going to be the, the way that you lose a lot of weight. It's going to contribute to it, but you have to couple nutrition and exercise, and uh, together those both will lead you to a healthier lifestyle. And achieving a healthy lifestyle is really what we all want. In the College of Human Ecology, researchers and nutritionists are looking at just about every aspect of what it means to eat healthy. That means including being a smarter shopper, looking at food labels, and truth in advertising as it relates to food with kids. Dr. Sarah Colby says it's really important though, the first step is understanding what our obstacles and problems are as we head down the road, for some of us, that leads to obesity. Obesity is really fundamentally a problem of, of energy imbalance. So it's either the calories that you're taking in are not matched to the calories that you're using up in a day. So if you're taking in more calories from the food you're eating than you're using from the physical activity you're doing, then you're going to gain weight. It, it is that simple. It's not that easy, unfortunately. Dr. Colby is a nutritionist in the Department of Nutrition and Dietetics. She says there are about five different influences in any given day that will help you decide what you're going to eat. One would be the environment. What is in your environment? What did you see on the way to work today? What was advertised? What did you hear on the radio? Uh, what did you see last night maybe while you were watching TV that sounds great and as you go by you, ha you didn't have enough time to cook something at home and you see something that you know is a two for one offer? Uh, how does that influence what you had for breakfast today? Um, also economics. That two for one offer might be cheaper. And in today's economy, that's a, a real factor for so many people. And we know that food insecurity, not having enough of the kind of food that you need, 
or having to worry about having enough food is related to obesity. So we worry about the environment, we worry about economics, we also worry about interpersonal relationships. So how did your mom feed you when you were little? How do you feed your kids? Um, also, how, how does your spouse or significant, significant other person eat? Uh, what do they want you to cook? Um, we also look at your friends. What kind of foods your friends are eating? We know that if your friends gain weight, you're more likely to gain weight. That's even more true to happen than if your spouse gains weight. So you really have to think about what your friends are doing and the kind of food environment you're in there. We also look at cultural influences. So ethnic background will play a role in what kind of foods you decide to eat. Religion plays a role in what you decide to eat, as well as physiology. So there's, there's such a complex interact, interaction between genetics and um, between your brain and your gastrointestinal tract and your adipose tissue, your fat cells actually all interact to say if you're hungry or if you're full. One of the changes that have occurred with the obesity epidemic is food portion sizes. We've actually increased how much we're eating. So what is the right amount of food and what food is better for us? So if you're gonna, if this is a serving size for an apple, when we say four servings in a day, then if you're getting an apple that say, I can't even get my hands around it, that's a lot bigger, then you're getting two servings right there. Or even three, depending on the size of the fruits that you buy at the store these days. So getting anywhere from two to four servings of fruits a day is, is a good plan. Um, for the vegetables, now there's some, there, I say eat as many vegetables as you can. Now the only thing there though is that there is a difference between starchy vegetables like green peas, uh, potatoes, count as a starchy vegetable, green peas, what else would be a starchy vegetable? Whereas a non-starchy vegetable might be carrots. For the carrots, you can eat lots and lots of carrots, or how about asparagus? This is half a cup of asparagus. So if you had a cup of cooked asparagus, that's great. If you want to have a cup and a half of cooked asparagus, that's fine too. So some of our non-starchy vegetables like a zucchini, squash, tomatoes. Uh, tomatoes are a vegetable because of how many calories they give us, not a fruit. I'm not going to talk about the botanical issue. <laughs> Um, so you can have really as many vegetables as you want. For our starches, we do want to be careful how many starches we get. Starches are good for us, and the, the closer to the way it came, the better. So if you have more unprocessed, like a brown rice, it's going to be a better choice than a white rice. If you had pasta, this would be, if I can get it, a white pasta. Um, if you can get a whole wheat pasta, it'd be much better. Now the other thing here is think about the serving sizes. This is about half a cup of pasta. This is a serving of pasta. So if you're having, say, six, eight servings a day, depending on your needs, everything's individualized now. If you're talking that this is a serving, how many servings do you have when you have spaghetti at night? So it's the volume. Or if you go out to eat at a restaurant and they gave you this much when you'd ordered, would you be happy? Whereas if you cut your plate in half or even thirds and you take the rest home, that's going to be a better choice for portion control. Dr. Colby also suggests starting your meal with a glass of water. The water and perhaps a nice light salad signals your brain that you're eating, and that can help you minimize how many calories you consume during the meal. Protein, something that, that in America we tend to get more protein than we need by far. And we also tend to get more meat than other protein sources that might be really good for us. But for instance, this is three ounces of chicken. This would be a serving size. That's a lot less than a lot of us eat. Uh, there are other protein sources, for instance, here is shrimp, that this is a serving size. So this is not very much shrimp that would count as a serving. It's a great source of protein. Um, here is a burger, three ounces for a burger. Now, again, we're eating more than that when we eat a, a burger. If you go out to a restaurant and this is what they gave you, would you go back? Is this enough? Or would you eat two? Would you get it doubled? But we just don't need that much. And there are other good sources of protein that we don't get enough of. Our nuts and our seeds, our beans, these are all things that in America we need to eat a lot more of. Pay attention to those gaps that you have in your, in your diet. Um, also, if you eat variety in moderation, anything, even healthy things, if it's too much of all the time, you may have problems. So if you use moderation in everything you do and variety constantly, you're probably going to be okay. So what about the bad stuff, such as fats and sugars? In addition to certain things that we need more of in our diet, like fruits and vegetables and fiber, there are certain things that we need less of, and we know we need less of in the American diet. One thing is sugar. For instance, if you have, we'll look at a food model oops, right over here. So if you have half a cup of vanilla ice cream, that has this much sugar in just that half a cup. 
we just don't need. It's okay to have vanilla ice cream occasionally, we just don't need it that much, and we need to watch your portion sizes there. With cereals, they have offered a lot of traditional cereals with lower sugar content now, and that's great. Uh, this uh, Lucky Char Charms brand cereal, for instance, if you had one cup of Lucky Charms, you have approximately this much sugar in there. So that, that's, are you, are, in the morning when your kids wake up, would you really want to pour this much sugar and say, here, honey, have this for breakfast? Something else that we may do without thinking about it, if you're grabbing a soda as you go, and you grab a nice large soda on your way, it's got about 310 calories, and it has almost seven tablespoons full of sugar in there. So that's a lot, this much is in here. That's a lot of sugar. Would you sit down and just eat this? But we do it without thinking about it. It can sneak up on us. Fat is another thing that a lot of us know it can sneak up on us. <laughs> and this is actually five pounds of fat. So you can imagine if you lose five pounds of fat, imagine taking this off your body. You know, that, that's, that's significant. <laughs> and unfortunately, a lot of us will take it off and we'll put it back on. It's really about adopting a healthy eating pattern that we feel good about. Small changes we can live with forever so we don't have to keep taking this off and putting it back on. And some of the places that contribute to that fat coming back on are the fat that we get um, for dinner, let's say. What are you going to have for dinner tonight? You might have some milk. Are you going to choose to have a cup of skim milk or are you going to choose to have a cup of whole milk? Because that's the fat difference between the two. There's a tiny little bit of fat in skim milk. Or maybe you might want to go with three ounces of chicken. That might, that's, there's some fat in there, but it's still a healthier choice than say if you, along with your soda, where we already have our nice sugar content, how about for your burger you might grab, you might have this much fat. And the problem is fat that stays solid like this at room temperature, the saturated fats that we get from animal sources, they kind of stay solid in the body too. So as they're, as they're flowing around, they're just going to get stuck in, in arteries and curves and turns and they're just going to keep sticking along the side and they're going to plaque up and they're going to get hard and they're going to stop that blood from flowing. And that's when you're at risk for a heart attack or for a stroke. Typically about half the food we consume are from fast food or other restaurants, which means about the other half likely come from grocery stores. And understanding what is on the product's nutrition label is crucial, especially for those products targeting kids. Most of the time, they have nutrition marking on the food, the front of the label, saying good source of vitamin C or some, you know, uh, high in protein, you might see, or you know, all natural. What we found is more often when products are marketed toward kids, they have nutrition information on the front saying, buy me, I'm good for you. About 79% of the time, they have something on the front saying, buy me, I'm good for you. The problem is, most of the time, they're also high in saturated fat, sodium, or sugar. So how can we become a more informed consumer? Okay, when you're reading a food label, there are many things to look for. The first thing you want to pay attention to is the serving size. Because if the serving size is one package, now in this case, you're probably going to stick with one package. Now if it's something that you know you're going to have two times as much, you need to multiply everything else by two. So the next thing you're going to look for here are the calories. And the calories, what you want are for them to be, say, under 200 calories. If it's, a, if it's a snack or many other items, if it's over 200 calories, that means it's probably giving you more calories than you might need for a snack, for instance. Um, what you want to look for as you go down, something we, we do is we look for things we don't want too much of. So if we don't want too much fat or saturated fat, if it's more than 10% here, then that's something we may not want. It's got, it may have more than we want in there. Same for the cholesterol and the sodium. So if it's more than 10%, again, may not be the best product for us. Now you want to look for the things you want more of. So you're going to look for, for instance, the fiber, something we need more of. If it's more than 10%, it's probably a good source of that. Colby says the 10% mark is a pretty good benchmark. For cholesterol, sodium, and the like, above 10% is bad. But for the good, like protein, vitamins, and minerals, anything above 10%, it's a plus. Also, have you ever looked at the ingredients on a label? There is a reason ingredients are listed in a specific order, and we as consumers need to know all about it. Actually, the, the order, the way that the ingredients are listed is they're ingredient by weight. So the things at the, the top of the list means that's what's in the most volume weight-wise in that product. So as you move on down, there is less of that product in, in the, the item. So it is something to be able to pay attention to, that if sugar is the first ingredient, if water is the first ingredient, sugar is the next ingredient, and then you move on down, <laughs> and they've added in some vitamins and minerals, then maybe flavored sugar watered with a little bit of vitamin C to make you buy it. So you do have to watch for that. 
Dr. Colby also suggests that we give ourselves a good three-month commitment when we decide to eat better and also commit to exercise. The goal is to get it into our daily routine, and that way it's easier to stay on track and we can all fight obesity better. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Inside ECU.